Okay, welcome everyone to today's course, which is the last one of the semester. So today we're going to end magnetic resonance imaging with advanced contrast mechanisms. So first, and essentially the theme is how does one image motion with MRI? We'll start with the first question, and that is how can one track motion with MRI, that is flow in the blood? Second is what is the effect of self-diffusion on the MR signal? Followed by the question, why is the diffusion typically in tissues not isotropic like we see in fluids? This will be the first part of today's course, and the second part we'll do a summary and comparison of the imaging techniques that we've dealt with in the semester. Okay, so how does bulk motion affect the signal of, a, of an echo? And for this, we'll consider these types of images. So this is an MRI, the so-called angiogram. So that's a depiction of flowing blood in the brain. That is done, and I'll introduce one of the many modalities that can be used to depict flowing blood, because it's very nicely linked to the second subject of today. So let's consider first the phase of the magnetization. And the phase of the magnetization is given by the transverse magnetization at the beginning, again in transverse, in, in complex notation, and then we have a phase evolution of the signal as a function of time. We can write this in all generality. And we have seen that for a gradient, that this is given by the integral of the gradient times the position uh, as a function of time and times the gyromagnetic ratio. Now here, I've put the position as a function of time, t prime, over which one integrates from zero to t. That's just to indicate that for a certain pocket of spins that are in a voxel, they might be moving during the imaging experiment. And so we want to know how does this motion affect the phase of the signal. So if we'll take um, this in general terms, I'll now just write an integral from 0 to 2t. I've broken it into two time integrals, time periods from 0 to t, and from t to 2t. It's given by the gradient, and we'll now assume that this gradient is first positive and then negative, so this integral becomes negative, and we have just minus gx. So what are we looking at? Essentially, that's what this represents. This is the gradient as a function of time. First positive, well, here's drawn negative, and then negative, well, here's drawn positive. That doesn't matter, that's just a sign. And then we introduce the phase is given by this integral of gradient times position, like we've introduced in generality here, in all generality. But now we'll assume that the position can vary uh, with time. Okay, so. Let's take the simplest case. We have magnetization in a blood vessel. The blood vessel is along x. We can just assume that. And for a blood vessel that's along x, the motion of the magnetization in that blood vessel is going to be, and we'll assume that this motion is at constant velocity. So the position as a function of time is given by a position at time 0 plus v times t. And then we can rewrite this integral. And now we'll call this the integral as v of 2t. Two two so that's at the end of this time period. That's the first period where the gradient is here in the drawing negative, in the calculations positive. And the second period where the gradient changed sign. So this gx is always positive. And we'll, we've substituted x of t in this expression. OK, so we'll calculate this integral. It's very trivial for both periods separately. And one obtains uh, the phase at the time 2t is equals to the gradient times the velocity times this time here squared for this particular case. OK, so how does this look like? How do we analyze this or how do we understand this? Well, we'll first look at a stationary situation. We'll look at the phase of the magnetization 
if the blood were not to move in the vessel. So this is just a little voxel of, or a little cube of blood that doesn't move. And I'll plot uh, on the y-axis the phase, on the horizontal axis time, t. So that's this graph we're going to look at. And now as one evolves during the gradient, there's first the phase accrual, then the gradient is inversed. That means the phase accrual, the slope is now equal slope but negative, so it goes down. And these are the time points of the integral that you have on the left-hand side of the slide. So we first go up and then we go down. That corresponds to the time period from 0 to t, and then from t to 2t, the second part. That's this part. So at this point, the phase is back to zero, and that is nothing. That is basically just a graphical depiction of the fact that the integral from here to here of the gradient times time is zero. Or this area is equal to this area, but with an opposite sign. And that's what we've seen is the condition for echo formation, and we call this time period TE. So I'll introduce TE now. We won't talk about 2T, but we'll talk about TE at this point. Okay, so now what happens if we consider the phase evolution in the first period and in the second period? How does this change? And we'll now just watch the, this blood here in the vessel, which will move along X, that's horizontal, linearly with time, so it's constant velocity in this direction. And as we move, the object through, then we have a quadratic phase accrual and then a quadratic phase loss. But in the end, as you can see, the phase does not go back to the initial phase, unlike for stationary spins. So there's a difference in the phase between stationary magnetization and the magnetization that moves in the direction of the gradient. Okay, and this we can call this at this time point the phase as a function of TE. And that this is non-zero, this comes from these two terms that are quadratically integrated with time. So for the transverse magnetization at the point x and y, we have the transverse magnetization is proportional to e to the i or the integral of the gradient times position dt, and this we have written as e, um, uh, e to the i kx of t times x. That's for uh, any magnetization. And now what this term here means, we just add this because now the phase, as you can see here, from the velocity, the phase that's accrued does not depend on where the magnetization in the blood vessel is. It does not depend on the position x. It's the same phase. It purely depends on the gradient strength, depends on the echo time, and depends on the velocity. The bigger the velocity, the bigger the phase difference. The bigger the gradient, the bigger the phase difference, and the more time we give it, the bigger the phase difference. So that means if one is to do an MRI image, like here on the top left, which has enough spatial resolution that you can have entire voxels inside the blood vessel, along the direction of the gradient that's applied, the magnetization will have a phase different, that is different relative to the magnetization of stationary tissue. So we can rewrite all this, and the magnetization now at this point is proportional to e to the i phi, and this is now given by this expression, and here t is just replaced by te, te half, it's the same expression. So essentially for the experiment depicted here, what this means is inside the blood vessel, that goes along the direction of the gradient, the magnetization will accrue a phase relative to the stationary tissue, and with some magic tricks, one can, uh, one can uh, image this phase. One has to do a reference experiment. One can image this phase and in that way obtain a map of flowing blood, of blood flow in the vessels and therefore depict the vessels. Okay, so that's the effect of flow, linear flow on the magnetization signal. Uh, on the magnetization produces a phase shift. And this brings us to the next topic. We've now s uh, dealt with the situation. We have a blood vessel. The blood flows linearly along that blood vessel. Now let's assume you have a voxel in the image where you've got all sorts of different directions of flow. 
Okay? And this flow is not correlated. Well, I say flow. What kind of motion is that? It's not correlated. It changes direction randomly. Well, that we know as diffusion. So diffusion has an effect, it's like flow, on the phase, but now, because it's within the VUI, it is a, an effect on the phase in total, and it's no longer, you can no longer have a measure of the directionality of the diffusion, but very similarly, one can depict, uh, measure the self-diffusion of molecules. So that's now the question, how does self-diffusion affect the the MR signal. We'll start out with just this general introduction of what we mean by self-diffusion, and then we'll go into analyzing what are the consequences on the MR signal. So essentially, if we mean self-diffusion, we mean a molecule that's inside our voxel, and that molecule will start at time zero, a random walk, and after the time delta, it'll be somewhere else, but this is a very random process. So here's an example for a mean displacement of 20 microns and a time of 100 milliseconds. Then this molecule will be, on average, be displaced by 20 microns. Here's another example where the diff time that one looks at is now 500 milliseconds, half a second. And in this case, for this particular example, the mean displacement will be 45 micrometers. And the molecule will, in this time, diffuse larger distance, or if we wait even longer, one second here in this example, here the, diff cell, uh, the, the mean displacement is 63 microns, and the molecule, of course, because one gives more time, can diffuse to larger distances. This comes, of course, all from Einstein's ran random walk, the description of mean displacement is, the mean displacement is given by the square root of six times the self-diffusion constants time the, times this um, delay time delta that one can allow for the random walk to happen. Okay, and what are the parameters that influence the self-diffusion of a molecule? So the diffusion constant we have seen that the, the mean displacement depends on the self-diffusion constant, which you have on the slide, the big D. This obviously is not the same. Okay, take an extreme example. You take a protein, put it in solution. That protein is going to move slower than a small water molecule. So here's two examples. One is an, a colored alcohol, and the other one is just colored water. And I'll just disperse it into one of those flasks. So here's the water. You can see the color dis distributes itself relatively slowly. Whereas if we take the ethanol, the alcohol that's in here, then you see on the left side, very rapid distribution. So the molecular properties, they influence the self-diffusion of the molecule. Depends on the type of molecule um, that's used, and if we wait long enough, then on the right-hand side, we'll see also after a few minutes that the color is equally distributed. That means those colored molecules has distributed equally in the water phase, but right now it's not there yet, whereas on the left side, the alcohol has distributed evenly, and so um, the diffusion, one can conclude the diffusion for the alcohol is faster than for the water emulsion. Okay, so that's, um, it would be an easy way to measure the types of molecules, the characteristics, to measure that in vivo, um, if one can measure the diffusion process. Another factor that influences the diffusion process, obviously, is also the temperature. And actually, if you take water and you do the MR measurements that I'm going to expl explain in a short while, you can actually measure from the diffusion behavior of water the temperature of the sample. So it's, it's that precise. 
Now we can see on the overhead projector that we have for the alcohol, we have almost equal distribution. OK, so we have the time, that's the experimental parameter. D is the self-diffusion coefficient. And that gives us an idea how far the molecule can diffuse. And now I want to ask the question, how does this random walk affect the MR signal? How does it affect the magnetization, and in particular the phase? We've already seen that coherent motion, like blood flowing in a vessel, produces a phase shift relative to stationary magnetization. A phase shift can detect it. Now what happens if we have incoherent motion, that is diffusion? OK, so we'll consider an RF pulse. We'll consider two gradients. Applied one negative, the first one, the second one positive, in the same direction. You can call it x if you want. Whatever you call it, it doesn't really matter. And now what happens in this experiment with the magnetization? We'll look at time A. At time A, after the RF pulse, there's no gradient, so all the magnetization of the RF pulse stays in, um, in phase. The, and we just pick three voxels, if you will, or three um, magnetization pockets inside the, the voxel. They will have all the same phase at this time point A. Now, during the gradient, I should say these three po pockets of magnetization, they're in the direction of the gradient. So they're different positions, but inside the voxel of the image. So they're different positions, let's say at different positions x, but inside the voxel of the image. Now, what happens during the application of this negative gradient? They will, of course, undergo a phase accumulation depending on their position that they have inside our imaging voxel. So they're now distributed. The phase is distributed because of their position. You can imagine it's a millimeter big voxel. One of the magnetization is at 300 microns, the other one at 600, and the third one at 900 microns to get an idea of what we're talking about. During time C, we turn off the gradient. That's boring. Nothing happens. We're looking at static magnetization. And during D now, we have the magnetization inverted. So the spin that had the fast, the gradient inverted, I'm sorry, not the magnetization. So the spin that has the fastest um, uh, precession was go going in one direction, is going in the opposite direction. And in the end, we'll have rephasing, and all the magnetization in our voxel are collinear, and we have echo formation. Now, what happens if we allow for motion? I'll start out again with these three pockets of magnetization in our voxel. We'll start out in position A, position B, and C. So we're here now from A to B. We have the same effect. And now we'll assume that during the time period C that there's motion. We can assume that the time period C is between the two gradients, that this is hundreds of milliseconds. We can assume that B is on the order, the time of the gradient when it's on is five milliseconds or so. It can be very short. But now let's assume we'll wait very long between the two gradients. And now within the voxel, there is diffusion. What happens now? If there is diffusion, this is simplified here because we only consider three magnetization vectors. This now considered that blue and orange have changed position. Okay, the number of molecules is constant, so one has to exchange position with the other. It's a very simple example, but now, since they have changed position, they have also changed, but they have kept their phase in the magnetization. And now what happens during the time period D? This is the exchange here that happened. They will now undergo the same phase change according to their position. Here's the gradient strength in the position. But now, because they have different starting phase than what was the proper phase up here for static magnetization, they will end up no longer being collinear. So they have different phases. And that all happens in the same imaging voxel of our uh, imaging sequence. So for these three spins, or these three magnetization pockets along the position, 
Now the net signal, because it's a vectorial addition of the magnetization vectors, the sum of the signal is reduced. Let's take this um, with more vectors instead of this just to illustrate here the effect of diffusion that this changes the position. I'll go into a more uh, detailed um, demonstration. But if you consider now uh, at the beginning, at this position here, indicated by this vertical bar, we have all the magnetization vectors collinear, so we have maximum net transverse magnetization. And when the gradient B is applied, they will have different precession frequencies according to their position. This is now again assuming that these four magnetization vectors correspond to four different positions in the direction of the gradient. So now they've acquired a different phase. And now I'll do the same thing for spins that have been displaced during time period C. So we'll start out again with everything collinear. During time period B, it's the same thing that's happening. They spread out these four magnetization vectors. And now, during time period C, for this case, we'll assume that there is diffusion on the right side. On the left side, we'll assume there's no diffusion. So all the molecules stay in the same place on the left side. It's theoretical, but just to show the effect. And on the right-hand side, we'll assume that they change position, one versus the other. I don't know exactly how it was done. The main principle is they will, under the influence of the gradient during the period D, they will be no longer subjected to the same gradient than they were subjected during B. So the gradient that they'll see here, I'm sorry, the gradient times position is not, the gradient's the same, but the gradient times position is not the same because the position has changed. So the phase accrual, the reversal of the phase is not going to be the same here. So this is what we see. All for the stationary spins, this is not very exciting. Nothing happens. They come back. That's what we've assumed so far for all imaging sequence. But on the right-hand side, because now all the magnetization vectors in our VOI have changed position with respect to the gradient, they no longer come back to have the same phase. They're out of phase, and you do just a vector addition of these four vectors. This is clearly smaller than the vector addition of these four vectors that are collinear. OK, so below you have the example of three magnetizations. On the top, you have it with four. And you can generalize that to 10 to the 23 magnetization vectors that are in your voxel, if you will. And yeah, the effect will be the same in qualitatively. OK, let's take another look at this with, uh, to take it one dimension higher, a bit more complicated. Here's the gradient again as a function of time. Go a blip up, a blip down, same magnitude, same duration. Say, so it's the same area. And if one has no incoherent motion, so all the magnetization, all the spins are stationary, then we have echo formation. They spread out under the influence of this gradient, which turns red here. And when this gradient comes on, it's now turning red, then they reverse their direction and come back at this time to be all collinear. That's echo formation. That's what we have assumed so far. So how does this look if we do a phase graph? So we plot the phase for a number of magnetization vectors that are in the, um, uh, in the direction of this gradient here at different positions. During the gradient, they will accrue a phase depending on their position. And you can see here the way it's drawn. We have six different equidistant magnetization pockets considered. During this time period, nothing happens. And then here, the gradient is negative. So the slope will be negative. But it will be the same in magnitude as the slope here, just negative. So they all end up at the same point. They're all in phase. They have the same phase. And that's the condition of echo formation. OK, now let's look at incoherent motion. This is now looking at a pocket of 5 by 5 magnetization vectors under the gradient, this gradient here. In this direction, they will accrue different phases depending on their position. So it increases linearly with position. That's what happens here. And now let's look what happens in the time period here. Between the two gradient pulses, 
This is the same drawing as here, but now I'll assume that in this time period between the two gradients, there is diffusion. And this is simplified by two pairs, or three pairs of magnetizations exchanging position. It's, of course, simplified. All of them will exchange position to varying degrees, but just to illustrate the principle here, I've just assumed in this 5 by 5 matrix of different magnetization pockets that six magnetization pockets have changed their position and will only consider the motion in direction of the gradient. And that's these three, the one on the top left, the second row on the right, and second last row here, these two guys, and they kept this, keep the same color, just to illustrate this. Okay, now what happens during this gradient, so the, the magnetic field strength is now changed with position, different slope, so they will undergo the same phase change as they were here, but in the different direction, and you can see they're all in phase. All the magnetizations go back that were stationary, except these two pairs. Because they have changed position, they will have a different phase now compared to the others. And now if you sum over these 25 magnetization pockets, you get a net magnetization vector that is smaller than what we would have had if we had no motion. And that's what we would have had at the end, is all the magnetization vectors collinear. So these guys that don't move, they didn't change because they're at the proper position and the other ones did change their magnetization phase. Okay, so to display, display this in, uh, with a phase graph, we plot the phase of five magnetization vectors over time. The slope goes up, so we'll take the same five that we had here. During the time here, nothing happens with the phase, but they've changed position. So now when they come, when we turn on the negative gradient here, then the slope is going to be different between the diff these five magnetization uh, so that we consider. The net magnetization phase here at the end is no longer the same, and so therefore the vectorial addition is not complete. And so, because they're not all in phase, one has still an echo, but a reduced echo amplitude. So the echo amplitude is reduced due to diffusion. Okay, so to summarize, diffusion creates a mismatch in the phase of the magnetization because now they're at different positions. So they're not properly refocused under the refocusing gradient. They end up in the echo time. Um, the phase of the magnetization ends up being not collinear, and that creates a reduction in echo amplitude. And that's how one can measure the effect of diffusion on the magnetic resonance signal. So what are the parameters that enter into describing the effect on the signal? And I will not bore you with the math of deriving and with an initio calculation of this process. It can be done. I'll give you rather the result and the main message. OK, the degree of echo signal reduction depends on the strength of the diffusion process. That makes sense. If the diffusion constant is high, that means the mean displacement of a molecule is large for a given time. That means when the gradient is refocusing, it will be at a much larger distance away from where it's supposed to be. So the phase the molecule accrues that's wrong compared to what it should have and it was stationary is much bigger. That makes intuitive sense. So if you look at the, our um, gradient, positive, negative, and there's a few parameters there that we look at. So we have the diffusion process. The second element that comes into play is the diff time difference between the two gradients. That also makes sense. Suppose we were able to turn on an infinitely strong gradient, positive, and immediately afterwards we turn on an infinitely strong, infinitely short gradient that's negative. In that infinitely short time between the two gradients, the magnetization, the molecules would have had no time to diffuse. So remember, the mean displacement is proportional to the time that we allow it to happen. So if they can't move, they won't be able to be at a different position. The effect will be reduced. So that makes intuitive sense as well. So the longer one waits, the more the molecule can diffuse, the larger is the mean displacement. And if the displacement is large, then the phase mismatch under the refocusing gradient 
is bigger. And the third element is also an experimental parameter, and that's the area of the dephasing gradient. But that affects the signal also makes sense. If the gradient is very strong times its duration, so it's g times the small delta there, then the phase that's accrued is proportional to the two. It's, it's proportional to the area of the gradient. And if now we have a given displacement of this magnetization after the time big delta, the phase has been relatively big. The same displacement will now create a bigger error in the phase of the negative gradient, and therefore the effect on the magnetization phase is stronger, and therefore the um, reduction in echo amplitude is bigger with the area of the dephasing gradient. So this is an example of how to introduce um, gradient diffusion weighting in a gradient echo sequence. In this case, the signal would also be dependent on T2 star. Sometimes the experiments are done this way. So how do these factors actually in reality come into play? So how does one describe the attenuation? And lo and behold, for all intents and purposes of this course, this is not the um, the latest description of the process, but it's sufficient to understand it. Turns out the signal is decays exponentially as a function of the diffusion constant. With this experimental pa parameter B, and that experimental parameter B is given by this equation here. It's essentially the area of the gradient squared. So it's this area squared times delta the difference between time difference between the two gradients minus a small corrective factor for the duration that takes into account that diffusion already starts during the application of the gradient. So this B value is an experimental parameter. It's because we can choose the gradient strength, we can choose the duration of the gradient, and in the experiment we can typically also choose the diff time difference between the two gradients. What we cannot choose is the diffusion coefficient here. That's given by the um, tissue under investigation. Well, it's actually, I call it diffusion coefficient. It's actually in the strictest sense of the physics, it's not a diffusion coefficient. That's why it's called the apparent diffusion coefficient. It's giving an indication of how well the molecules can diffuse. Okay, now how does this sequence here look if we want to measure diffusion weighting with a spin echo? So only T2 weighted, then we'd have two positive gradients, same parameters. Not to forget that in this case we have to apply 180 degree pulse to generate the spin echo. That's a perfectly equivalent way of measuring the diffusion between the two types uh, of sequences. The top one depends on T2 star and the bottom one depends on T2. So why would one go through the trouble of doing the bottom sequence spin echo with 180 degree pulse? Any idea? What's the difference between T2 and T2 star? What's the relationship? So T2 star we have seen is always long, shorter than T2. To describe a diffusion process well, one wants to have a fairly long delta, big delta. So in order not to lose too much signal, this would be the preferred way of measuring diffusion because T2 is longer than T2 star, even though in terms of diffusion, these two are identical in terms of the effect. This one would be preferred because the T2 is longer. So what you do at this point is you measure your MR signal and all that one varies is the gradient strength here or the area of the gradient, duration or gradient strength. Typically, it's the gradient strength. One varies the B value, measures pixel by pixel the amplitude of the MRI signal, gets an exponential decay, fits an exponential to that, and one can determine the diffusion constant. So that's fairly simple and obvious to do. Well, if life were that simple. So, in a water beaker, the water molecule 
during such a sequence will diffuse to a random walk and where it ends up in which direction in space, x, y, or z, will be completely random. That's isotropic diffusion behavior. In an isotropic medium, you will have the molecules go into all sorts of direction according to Einstein's random walk, but where they end up in x, y, z is completely random. So they essentially go out in a sphere. We've kind of seen that with the colors on the overhead projector. So if we look at um, now structures that we have in tissue, we can look at an axon that's myelinated or a myofibril that's a muscle cell. We'll stick with the brain here because that's where diffusion magnetic resonance has made most of its impact. Then we have the axon here. We have the myelin sheath around it. That's, those are membranes that have an influence on how the water molecule can behave. Just to give you an idea what we're looking at, these are the axons here. These are the myelin sheaths and Typically, you have them aligned like this. The muscle has a very similar structure. So for a molecule, water molecule that's inside the axon, we consider the, for, for this uh, discussion, we'll consider the membranes as impermeable to water, to water. So for a water molecule that's inside the axon, it's in prison, cannot go anywhere. It's stuck in there. So what does that mean for the mean displacement. Does the mean displacement now increase with diffusion time? It's limited, right? Now let's look at a water molecule that's outside between the, 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 the axons, outside of the myelin sheath. These are the myelin sheaths here. This molecule obviously can go anywhere it can in diffuse in the extracellular space. Technically, it can go from my right ear to my left ear. One allows for its efficient time. Whereas the water molecule that's inside the axon, it's stuck to stick being inside the axon. Or if you think of a cell as a spherical cell, they don't exist really, but if you just idealize a cell as a spherical object and the water molecule cannot get out, then it's stuck to that spherical shell. So obviously, that is a different diffusion behavior. And um, to illustrate this, we have a little experiment that I want to demonstrate. What we're going to look at is the output of a, of a microscope. And we're going to look at some particles moving in a fairly random fashion. There we go. So you see there's big particles, it's a colloidal sus suspension. There's big particles, there's small particles. But if you look at the bottom right, it's fairly dense. You still see some of the smaller particles moving, but they're restricted by the big particles. That you can think of, that's like the cell membrane. That restricts or hinders the diffusion. Whereas in the, um, the, the, on, the, on the top half, you have some, in, some in, in the void space, you have some very small particles. And you can see they can go basically, uh, they move fairly freely around. They're not restricted in their diffusion. Now you just take this behavior. So when there's big particles around, you think of that as, as cell membranes. That restricts the motion that they can have in, 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 by the dimensions of the cell. OK, so we've got, um, where's a good one? Yeah, on the left side in the middle, whoops, it now just went out of focus. There's, there's some molecules that are moving around fairly far, some of these particles. That's to illustrate the Brownian motion. OK, so how, how, how does that manifest itself with real um, Cells. Well, if you look at the axon, 
we have in one direction, we have essentially unrestricted diffusion. That's the direction of the axon. Take a squid axon, which can be very long, or you pretend one of the axons in the brain, they can also be very long, and you assume it's going all in one direction. Or take a muscle cell, you know, here. One of those muscle cells can be fairly long. The, the, the so in that direction, the displacement can be very big. Even if it's intracellular, inside the axon, the water in this direction can have a large mean displacement, whereas in the direction perpendicular to the orientation of the axon, the mean displacement is essentially limited by the axonal diameter. So, and that's the general rule that the motion of the water molecules, that is the diffusion, is restricted by the cell membranes and most cells have an asymmetric structure with one with a certain directionality. Here the axons are the example. This means we have an anisotropic mean displacement. It's bigger in this direction than in this direction. And since we have seen earlier that there is a relationship between mean displacement and diffusion, apparent diffusion coefficient, this means we have an anisotropic diffusion coefficient. So the experiment in the, in the water beaker, everything's isotropic, doesn't matter how the gradient is applied, it will always give us the same measure of, iso, uh, of diffusion. Now it depends on how the gradient is applied. If we apply the gradient in this direction, we'll have a bigger phase accrual, stronger attenuation, bigger apparent diffusion coefficient. If the gradient is applied in this direction, the mean displacement is small, the, the apparent diffusion coefficient that one measures is small. So, what this means is the apparent diffusion coefficient depends on the orientation in which one applies the gradient. If one applies the gradient along the direction of the axon, the diffusion coefficient, the apparent diffusion coefficient is bigger than if it is applied uh, perpendicular. And therefore, the process is described, can be described by the diffusion tensor, which is given by this nice little 3 by 3 matrix. So that's in all generality how the diffusion process is described. The different elements mean imply the measurement. XX means the measurement along X, YY along Y, ZZ along Z. Those are the diagonal elements. The off-diagonal elements are XY in the direction at 45 degrees between X and Y xz 45 degrees between x and z, and yz 45 degrees between y and z. Okay, it's difficult to picture how important this process is, and so I'm going to show you three images where the diffusion gradient was applied along x, y, and z. It's always the same subject, it's the brain. We're going to look at the image the way it appears. So this is the first image along Z. Now Z in this place, in this case, means perpendicular to the screen. And the second image is along X, which means horizontally. Do you see the differences? Don't have to look far. Do the images look identical? No, they don't look identical. So clearly there is, just by looking at this, these two images, one can already deduce that there is anisotropic diffusion in the brain. So, this is the corpus callosum here. This is a structure of axonal connections between left and right hemisphere. So, the axons are oriented in the x direction. So, the signal is strongly attenuated. Here, it's almost, the signal's come, almost gone like the, 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 the water filled fluids. And here, it's hardly attenuated because here the gradient is applied perpendicular to the orientation of the axons. So the signal is less attenuated. And now let's take Y. That's up, uh, from bottom to top in this direction. That's applying the gradient along the Y direction. And you see here again a different contrast, a different appearance. This means that we also have fiber orientation along Y. Where could they be? Well, they're most likely here in this direction, also down here. But in this direction, these are fiber tracks, and 
Here they are in the thalamus, they are going along Z out of the plane. What appears dark in all three images is CSF. There we have isotropic diffusion because that's basically just liquid filled space. Okay, so I will finish uh, the diffusion imaging and then we'll break in about five minutes just to give you the examples. So this diffusion tensor that describes the diffusion process, fortunately it's a symmetric matrix, so it has three orthogonal eigenvectors and one can calculate, once one has measured the diffusion tensor, one can calculate the eigenvalues. So it's basically described by an ellipsoid whose principal axes are described by the uh, eigenvalues and the directionality is given by the eigenvectors. In the reference frame of the eigenvectors, this is just a diagonal matrix. Okay, so one can measure the mean diffusivity, that's the trace of this matrix of the tensor. The fractional isotropy is the difference between the largest and the smallest eigenvector. That gives you an idea how strong is the diffusion process oriented in one direction. And now what one does is one determines for each imaging voxel the diffusion tensor. And from that diffusion tensor for each voxel one determines the direction of the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. That just means the biggest part of the diffusion process is in this, or, or the, the fastest diffusion in this direction. The biggest eigenvector corresponds to the origin or orientation of the axons. And then one can color code the directionality. Now you see here, in each of the image pixels, that's just a zoom of this image here, in each of the pixels one has drawn this ellipsoid that corresponds to the description of the diffusion tensor. The orientation of the ellipsoid is giving you the directionality to make it more visible. It's pseudo-colored, so red for right, left in this case, blue for through plane, and green, I think, is up, down. And what you can see here, this is the corpus callosum, the right, left orientation. One starts to see the cigar-shaped orientation of the diffusion in each of the imaging voxels, indicating the direction of the axons. And in the end, one can color code an image in this way, so red is right left, blue is front to back, and green is in and out of the plane. So what we see on, so on the previous slide with this, this information, one can pseudo color the image and one sees in which direction is the diffusion oriented um, in the brain. In red, the corpus callosum, then we have here the projections anterior, posterior, and some vertical projections through the thalamus in green. This is an example from a rodent brain. This applies also for, for, for rodents. They have, of course, a much more primitive brain structure, less gyrification. And what you see here now is a change in color in the cortex. So here on the side, what the color is red. So that means there's a preferential orientation of the cells that goes right to left, horizontally. On the top, it's blue, so it's going from top to bottom. And this is just a manifestation, experimental demonstration that the cortex in the rodent, the cellular structure, has a preferred radial orientation. So the orientation of the cells, there's a predominance of cells who are, whose orientation is perpendicular to the surface of the brain. There are, of course, a number of examples what type of cells these correspond to, but I don't want to go into the details here. That's for a neuroscience lecture. Okay, so the application that one has developed now is, among others, and I'll stick with this one, is fiber tracking in the brain. And in this modality, one exploits the diffusion anisotropy to develop a map of the connections in the brain. So first what one obtains is an image of the diffusion anisotropy. This is a pseudo-colored map. Here are the ellipsoids. And then if two ellipsoids of two adjacent voxels connect very nicely, 
one says, well, we're, this is essentially showing the diffusion behavior of an axon that passes through, vo through both voxels. And when one does that, so you start out with a diffusion image, you look in each pixels, you see these ellipsoids, you start to connect them. This gives you a connectivity map, and one traces in with a seed point, traces this connectivity, and that gives one an image of the brain that corresponds to like a fairly ordered collection of spaghetti, uh, color-coded according to their orientation. Here's a different view of the same process of the same image. One establishes with that the fiber tracks. So here's another example showing all the fiber tracks in the brain. And what one now can do, this was actually work pioneered here in Lausanne, is one can then establish a network of which brain region is connected to which brain region. And this gives you a whole brain structural connection network or in short what it is now known as a connectome. So one can analyze which part of the brain is talking to which part through the neuronal connections and uh, es uh, establish the connectivity. OK, so that's so much for diffusion. Uh, that's the last new topic that I'll introduce this semester. And in the second half of today, um, I'll do a summary of the imaging modalities that we have dealt with so far. Okay, and we'll reconvene at 20 after.